Let's turn again to Proverbs. We've come as far as chapter 18. Man, we're going to break, breakneck speed, man, like four or five verses every Wednesday night. At this rate, we may get it done before Jesus gets here. I don't know. We'll have to see. But we've come as far as chapter 18. We finished last week, verse 8, and so we'll pick up in verse 9 this week. And so as you're turning to Proverbs chapter 18, put your finger there on verse 9. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. You know, all across the country, we're getting so many responses uh, from people who tune in by way of our live stream. Just encouraging, Lord, encouraging this church and me as a pastor, because we're going through Proverbs and are getting so much out of it. Uh, one lady said, you know, it's, she's never been more convicted, but she's just loving it. Because Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It's where the rubber meets the road. And and sooner or later, you know, Solomon's going to get around in these 375 Proverbs to dealing with some issue in our life. And we just pray that we would have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Because, Lord, we, want to, we don't want to just be hearers. We want to be doers of your word. And so, Lord, as we look at some more of these Proverbs tonight, we'll see how far we get. May again, you just speak to our hearts, we would pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we would ask. And all God's kids would say. Amen. Hey, the first one can be quite convicting. Listen very carefully to verse 9. He also that is slothful. You know, <laughs> I love the old King James. Some of the words they use, some of the modern translations will say lazy or have a poor work ethic. Not, not old King James, man. Even the word just sounds you know, like somebody's moving slow, like a sloth. You're slothful. Listen very carefully. He also that is slothful in his work or in the work ethic is brother to him that is a great waster. Now, this is important. And again, Proverbs speaks a lot about the heart, a lot about the tongue, a lot about the attitude, but it also deals a lot with practical things in life. And did you know that work was ordained by God as far as Adam was concerned before the fall. Did you know that? See, work is not a curse. Sometimes we think it is. And sometimes, you know, we're in a big hurry to get to that point where we don't have to work anymore. I'll tell you, for my father, he was an engineer. And when he had to be, uh, because of the four silent heart attacks he had, um, because he was forced into retirement, he hated every moment of it. Uh, he had a strong work ethic. He gave me a strong work ethic. You know, I like to work. I like to work hard at whatever I do. I want to be diligent because in some way I know that it's honoring to the Lord. Because the Bible says, whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it ambitiously. Do it with some zeal as unto the Lord. And so work is very important. And we're told not to be slothful. In fact, Jesus said, go consider the ant who doesn't have a king or a governor, nobody ruling over him. And look at how he works diligently to bring in his food for the winter. And so, listen, work is very important. But there's another lesson in this I think it's even equally important, not just a challenge to work, but he says, if you don't, then you are brother to the one who destroys. Listen to what Jesus said. And I find this interesting because sometimes we read glibly past these passages and these things that Jesus is saying, we don't understand exactly you know, to the full, what he is saying. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus said this, he that is not with me is against me. How many have quoted that? And we think that you're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. And that's the truth of it. Jesus said, for me or against me. You're with me or you're not with me. You're either in or you're out. You're either walking in light or you're walking in darkness. But listen to the next step statement that he connects with this. He says this, and he that gathereth not, listen carefully, he that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. When you look at the construct of that sentence, what you understand, Jesus is saying you're either working for him or you're working against him. Either you're bringing people into the faith or you're against the faith. Isn't that interesting that Jesus would say that? Because if you're not gathering with me, Jesus would say, then you are scattering abroad. 
There's no neutrality in this thing of having a work ethic, especially when it comes to spiritual things. You know, Proverbs, we're going to get to that one that says that he that wins souls is wise. And part of the work that God's called all of us to do is to be a faithful witness to this world. That's why Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You don't hide a light under a bushel basket. You, you shine it so that everybody can see it. You are an epistle read of all men. In fact, you're the only Bible some people will ever read. And so here, as we apply this particular proverb, he's saying that the slothful man, the one who has a poor work ethic, um, that doesn't understand the urgency of the moment. You know, again, Jesus said that you need to labor while it's yet day, because night comes when no man can labor. He's saying, if you are slothful and you're not laboring in the master's field, if you're not working for the master, then you are a brother to the one who destroys. If you're not gathering with me, you are scattering. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty convicting to me. I loved it when I had my heating and air business because I was in and out of homes every day and I had got plenty of opportunity to witness to people. Now I'm just serving the Lord by studying and I'm very diligent to do that. You know, I don't coast, <laughs> although I've taught through the Bible many, many times, I'm still up there diligently studying because I want to be a workman who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So my work is studying to feed you. But man, I miss those days when I would just look for opportunity. I would think of ways to stick my foot in the door, to start a conversation with somebody so that I could share my faith with them. Uh, take this to heart. Take this as a challenge tonight, if you would. Uh, we're living, if we ever were living in a time where the sun is going down, and pretty soon none of us will be able to labor, would you say we're living in that time? How many would say tonight that you have unsaved loved ones, people you care about that have not come to faith yet? The second question would be, then what are you doing about it? Because Jesus said, if you're not gathering with me, then you're scattering. The, the slothful person, he's a kin, he's brother to the one who destroys. And so, you know what, if, if it's not easy for you to witness, if it's not... You know, if that's not your personality to be that kind of bold, ask the Lord to give you that kind of boldness, especially with the people you care about. You know, I used to say to people, you know, when I first got saved, I didn't have a lot of tack. I still don't have a lot today, I know. But I used to tell them at the end of it when they would try to resist, I said, there's a day coming when you would have wished I would have taken a baseball bat and beat you into the kingdom. Because I was serious about this. And so, again, the challenge that Solomon gives us tonight is, don't be slothful, especially about the master's business. Jesus, at a very young age, told his parents, remember when they were leaving, and there was a crowd coming out of uh, Pentecost, and they look around, and little Jesus is not there. Twelve years old, and man, where's little Jesus? They can't find him in the crowd, and so they have to go all the way back, and there they find him in the temple teaching the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders. And they start to scold him, and he says, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Twelve years old. You look at Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, whisked away from Judea to Babylon in captivity. And they were about their father's business. Amen? So, Hey, just take that challenge. Um, ask the Lord to help you to be about the Father's business, um, to, to redeem the time. Use it wisely because the time is short. And just, again, be a laborer in the master's field. Uh, again, you know, Jesus, uh, when they were coming out from Samaria, said to his disciples, look up at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Pray for laborers. Because the laborers are few and the harvest is great. Amen. If there ever was a time to, to prioritize your time, if there ever was a time uh, to redeem the time, if there ever was a time to use your time wisely, it is today. Because listen, I think Jesus is coming back very soon. And I think our time is very short. And, and if you're going to be witnessing to somebody that doesn't know the Lord you care about, I don't know how many more days or months you have to take care of this. Uh, things could change very rapidly. We're seeing cha things change 
in the last four or five months, haven't we? How much faster are they going to change after the election if it doesn't go the way we think it's going to go? So you just listen. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Uh, the next verse, especially the next two verses, will really speak to us tonight, seeing that everything that's going on. Listen very carefully. How, how many, let me ask you this. I was going to ask you this before we got into the study so I could pray for you. How many tonight are just stressed? You feel the spiritual warfare. You feel the stress. Just go ahead and raise your hand. How many are stressed? How, how many are a little fearful of the future? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, how many are kind of nervous? You just feel this, this, this rub in your spirit, this spiritual warfare going on. How many have been feeling and sensing some of that? Doesn't mean you're giving into it, but you're sensing it. You're aware of what's going on. You look around today and you realize the world is disintegrating. It's moving uh, in a direction that is going to have to uh, culminate with the Lord returning. And it's going to happen pretty soon. Well, in the, in the midst of all of this, because we're told, we're told in Scripture when we study eschatology that in the last days, things are going to get worse and worse. Uh, Paul told us that these would be perilous times. He talked about demonic spirits being seducive and doctrines of devils and demons. He talked about spiritual warfare amping itself up. He's talking about we being hated of all nations for our name's sake. And look what's going on. You know, we're under a mandate here in California right now to cease and desist as churches. People are going to be fine, and eventually they'll, they'll be going to jail simply because they walk into a building and want to worship the Lord because they want to go to church and be fed God's Word. You can go to anything else and gather, but you can't go to church. This is a spiritual battle. But listen carefully to this next verse. I think it's extremely important in the time that we're living in. It says this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Uh, a tower is a place that you ran into in the time of battle for protection. The righteous runneth into it, and they are safe. I want to spend a little time developing this, because this is a tremendously encouraging verse in the time that we're living in. Because we have a place to go. We have a place that we can hide in His pavilion. We can feel his presence, his strength, and his power. I'll tell you, for two hours on Monday morning, from 9.30 to 11.30, the power and the presence of God descended on that prayer meeting. I don't know how many, maybe 15 of us in there. But I will tell you, the peace of God, the strength of the Lord. How many were there there here tonight? Did you sense that? Did you feel that? I'm going to tell you, it was powerful. Uh, I go up into the mountains often now because, and it's not because I'm going camping and recreating. I'm going to get on my face because in the times we're living in, I need his strength. I need his presence. I need to run into that high tower because in that place, I feel safe. It's where God communicates to my heart and he tells me things are going to be okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about what's going around here. Keep your eyes on me. Just keep one foot in front of another, keep on that narrow path. Listen, it's not long. You can do it. Don't give up. 1,732 pastors this month quit the ministry in, in the United States. Never to return again. That's Barna's research. Three good friends of mine did. They said, I had enough. And it's not just people, it's the warfare in the mind and in the heart. And I'll tell you why they're quitting, because they don't know this verse. They don't know this verse. Christians are walking away from their faith because they don't know this verse. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And they that run in are safe. Now, let me spend a little time developing this because I think this is an important one of those Proverbs of Solomon. We understand the name of the Lord as God revealed it to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. And we'll just read chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Because as Moses is being called now to be a deliverer of the nation of Israel, he asks the question, well, when I go back and I tell those people, when I tell Israel that 
that God has told me to do this, what am I going to tell them your name is? Good question. And God said to Moses in verse 14 of Exodus chapter 3, Moses, I am that I am. I like it on so many levels. Number one, it teaches us that he is immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever because he is the great I am. He doesn't change. There's no shadow of turning in him. He is the I am. He never was. There never was a time he wasn't. There'll never be a time he isn't. He lives in the absolute eternal past, present, and future at the same time. He is the great I am. And he said, Thus shall thou say unto the nation of Israel, I am has sent thee unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, listen carefully, as he's communicating with them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name. Now you're going to communicate to this. This is my name forever, and it is my memorial for all generations. So the name of the Lord, the Lord our God, the, the, the premier name, and he has a lot of other names that he goes by. Jehovah Tesidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. I love that one. But his main name, according to his own declaration in Exodus chapter 3, is I am that I am. I am the I am. And so we read in Genesis chapter 15, as we go through a few verses of the Old Testament that describe what that name means. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, it says this, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What is the first thing he is to us? He's our shield. Now let me ask you, can you think anything can get past him to get to you if he's your shield? I don't think so. I am your shield and your great reward. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, it says this, And behold, I am with thee. He's an ever-present help. I will keep thee in all thy places, whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken unto thee. God's promise to us, because he's the I am, he's ever-present, he will never leave us. In the New Testament it says, nor forsake us. No doubt a quotation from this Old Testament passage. And what he's saying is, I'm an ever-present help in a time of need. Not only am I your shield, not only am I your high tower, but I'm an ever-present help. You know, again, Psalms 121. You know, we lift our eyes to the hills from whence our help comes because our God, He does not sleep nor does He slumber. He watches over us. He's an ever-present help. And listen, if you don't know that this evening, it's because you haven't stopped to listen. He's an ever-present help in a time of need. In fact, back in Genesis 6.6, 6, it says this, Wherefore saith the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring thee out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid thee of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. He's our defender, our shield, our defender, our ever-present help in a time of need. But more importantly, when we come to the New Testament, John uses eight I am's describing Jesus. The eight I am's of Jesus. Uh, the first of which is in John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He's our spiritual food. Have you been feeding in the right places? Now I challenge you, man, turn off the news. Open your Bibles. Feed on the bread of life. He says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Uh, and that speaks of spiritual truth. It speaks of it giving us direction. He's a lamp unto our feet. He's a light unto our path. He's the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verse 7, it says, I am the door of the sheep. Now, this is interesting. For a long time, I didn't quite understand 
exactly the fool of that until we went to Israel. And J. McCall took us to this little place, and some of the people didn't want to get off the tour bus to go down there because we had to hop a fence and go down this muddy, muddy trail. And we came to this, what was, what was a field. And it was the same field that the shepherds were in when the angel of the Lord appeared when the star rose above Jerusalem or where Jesus, Bethlehem, where Jesus was at right there. So we're out in Bethlehem, and so we're trekking down to this place, and then, he, and then in the side of this mountain, there's this hollowed out thing. It was kind of natural the way the ground formed. It's like the rock formed, and it kind of hollowed out, and there were rocks brought around each side until there was just a gap for the sheep to go in. And then at night, once the sheep got into this pen, this natural pen, this place of protection, then the shepherd would lay in the door. So nothing could come in to hurt them, nor could they go out. So he could protect them. I am the door of the sheep. I am your spiritual protection. I am the resurrection of life. Listen, I am eternal life, and I give it to whoever I will. And one of the gifts we've, we've received from the Lord is that we have this resurrection life living in us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd watches over the sheep. The good shepherd leads the sheep. The good shepherd is among the sheep. He's the good shepherd. He says in uh, John 14, 6, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Uh, listen, he's the way back to the Father. In, in John chapter 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. When you're, when you're plugged in as a branch into the vine, it is the source of all strength. What he's saying, I'm the source of all of your strength. I'm the source of your sustenance. I'm the source of everything that you have need of. The first seven, let's look at them again. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. All of these things are for us as we're connected to him. But the last of these, number eight, is the capstone, as far as I'm concerned. In fact, it's found in John chapter 8, verse 58. And most people don't include this. Most people say that, that, that John only mentions seven I am's as he's relating to Jesus and relating God's name to Jesus, uh, you know, God's eternal son uh, in, incarnate. But I like to add number eight. Listen to what number eight says. Jesus said to them when they were challenging him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. What he's saying is, I'm God. And because I'm God, listen, listen, church, because he's God and he hasn't relinquished his throne, because he's God and he reigns in the affairs of men, because he is the almighty God, the great I am, he is the bread of life for you and me. He is the light to our path. He's the light of the world. He is the one who guards the sheep door so nothing can come in and get us. He is the resurrection and the life. He's the good shepherd. He's the way. He's the true vine because he's God. Now, I want you to understand this evening, that's the one we serve. Listen to what Solomon said. He said this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. It's impenetrable. And they that run into that place are secure. They're safe. God protects them. He watches over them. He takes care of them. He feeds them. And I'll tell you today, the only safe place in this world is there. Would you say amen? And I'll tell you, man, <laughs> I'm not running in there. I've just set up camp. I'm not leaving there. <laughs> I forget that running in and running out stuff, man, because he says he'll bless you and you're going in and comings out. But I told him the other day, I'm just not going out. I'm coming in and I'm staying. Listen, Lord, I'm moving in. Scoot over. You're a high tower. I'm camped right here because I want to make it to the end. I want to run this race to the end. I want to be found faithful to the very end. And I know the source of my strength. I know the name of my God. And I know that he has given me 
permission to use that name. And even at the mentioning of that name, he says the demons have to tremble and Satan has to flee. We have authority. We have a place of refuge. We have a place that we can run into that is a safe place where the presence of the living God just overshadows us and protects us and wraps his loving arms around us. Guys, listen. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it, and they are safe. Now, in comparison, he says something else in verse 11. Listen carefully. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. That's what he trusts in. And as a high wall, that is his riches, the things he's provided for himself, they become his high wall, and it is to his own conceit that he trusts in those things. Uh, let me read you something from, from Jeremiah. Years ago, I was doing a uh, men's conference down in Mammoth. And it was the first time I, I met Rob Yardley. He was on staff at Berean Call. You know, it's just interesting when you look back over your life, how God has you in the right places to meet the right people at the right time to put you in the positions you need to be to do what God wants you to do. There's a verse we're going to see in a few moments that will kind of describe that. But this uh, pastor, there's a couple of the Calvary chapels down in Southern California. They wanted me to come and teach their, their, their men's conference. So I drove down to Mammoth and Rob Yardley was doing the morning devotions and I was doing all the evening sessions. And his devotion was on Jeremiah chapter 9, as we're going to read in a few moments, verse 23 and 24. And, you know, I'd read that so many times, but there was something he said or the way he said it or just the atmosphere or the place I was at, did it hit me like it had never hit me before? And listen to what Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 says. And I think that this would be something that would be very applicable to us tonight. Thus saith the Lord. This is God speaking. And listen, whenever you see that phrase, don't just blow past it. How many times have you read the Bible and it says, thus saith the Lord? And you kind of just, okay, that's an introduction. No, it's not an introduction. It's more than that. This is God's fingerprints on his written word telling you he's about to say something to you. He's about to say something to you of, of the most grave importance. It's almost like he's saying you need to listen up. Because I'm about to say something that's going to be very pertinent. I'm about to say something that's going to be paramount in your life. And so listen up to what I'm about to say. And so he says this in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. So many times, you know, people trust in their own wisdom or they trust in their own strength. Or they trust in their own ability to provide for themselves. And here God says, don't let the rich man glory in his riches. Don't let the mighty man glory in his might. And, and certainly don't, you know. Uh, and so then he moves into the next verse. Very important. But let him that glorieth. If you are going to glory in anything. If you're going to, to, to boast about anything. Uh, then let your boasting be in this, the Lord would say, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Doesn't just know about me. Religious people know about him. But you understand the nature and the character of your God. You know who he is. And you have a personal relationship with him. That's what we are to glory in. Then he says this, that he understands and knoweth me that I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Man, if, if you want to brag on anything today, listen, especially in the time we're living in, uh, your security is not in your Wisdom, it's not in your riches, it's not in your strength. 
You want to glory in something tonight, man, you ought to be thankful. I, I found myself this morning in my devotion or prayer time just, um, and I got a longer time this morning because Kyle had to leave very early to go babysit the grandkids so Karis could go do something. So I got a longer time this morning just alone in my, in my prayer time. And I was just thinking, Lord, how many people in this time don't know you? How many people in this time are so stressed out because they don't have a strong tower, your name, to run into? How many people are trusting in their own wisdom to try to figure this stuff out or their own strength to get through it or their own riches to protect them in it? And yet, Lord, tonight we can say that we know you. We know who you are, we know what you are, and you are a strong tower. And so it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. But the rich man, he trusts in his wealth. And uh, it becomes his strong city. It becomes his high wall and his own conceit. Verse 12, before destruction, just before destruction, Solomon would say, the heart of a man is haughty. Uh, that, that word for haughty has the sense of that it boasts in itself. It's self-reliant, self-conceited, self-reliant. It boasts in itself. And before honor is humility. Um, you know, I find it interesting that the only time that Jesus speaks of himself, when you're, when you're reading through the scripture, Jesus is speaking to us. But there is on at least one occasion that he speaks of himself. And I find that quite interesting. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, listen carefully. This is Jesus. This is God incarnate in human form. This is Jesus talking about himself. You'd hardly ever see that. In fact, I can't think right now offhand one other place. I couldn't think of it today. One other place where you see Jesus describing himself or talking about himself. But, but this is what he says. Listen carefully. He says, take my yoke upon you. How many know what a yoke is? How many have seen a yoke? How many have been around places where you see two, two oxen or two cows with this yoke? that They're yoked together. They're coupled together. Um, they're, they're, they're laboring together. They're pulling in the same direction together. And Jesus is saying, as it were, let me put my arm around you. You put your arm around me and let's be yoked together in this journey of life. That's the idea here. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And here's what you're going to learn about my nature. Here's what you're going to learn about my character. Because we're called to become like Jesus. He says this, For I am meek and lowly. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. That word for meek there is the same word used in the Greek to domesticate a wild animal. It means that you are teachable. You have a teachable spirit. You have a teachable spirit because you are lowly. You are humble. And because you are humble, because, you, you know, you're not self-exalted. You're, you're not filled with pride. You're, you're not filled with what he just talked about here. Uh, you're not haughty. You're not high-minded. You don't think you know it all. In fact, you know that you don't know it all. And because you're humble, you seek God's wisdom. And when you seek God's wisdom, because you have a meek spirit about yourself, because you have a teachable spirit, then God will pour into you his wisdom and into you his spirit. And when he does that, then you will be lifted up in honor. Before honor comes humility. But before destruction comes a haughty spirit. And it's it is though Solomon is saying this, you need to choose. Because if you have a meek and teachable spirit, if you are humble, then God can pour his wisdom into you. And when he pours his wisdom into you, he will lift you up. That's exactly what James said. 
James said that God resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and in due season he will what? He will lift you up. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is in Isaiah, and he's finishing up the book. He's in the 66th chapter. The nation of Israel has already told him what, what they were going to do for him, and He's laughing. He's saying, what could you do for me? Really? Seriously? The heavens of the heavens can't contain me. The earth is my footstool. What are you going to build for me? But then God says, but if you want to get my attention, now let me ask you a question. How many tonight, seriously, want God's undivided attention? You want God to look at you. Uh, you want to do something that garners his attention. Now, his eyes are on the righteous, ears are attentive to his prayers. But here Isaiah says, man, you, you want to impress the Lord? Isn't it amazing that we could impress him? It amazes me that I could do anything that he would look my direction because of. But here, the Bible says we can impress the Lord. We can, we can, we can garner his undivided attention. And it's not through the things that we do with the work of our hands. But we're going to see tonight, it's the attitude of the heart. You see, man judges the outward appearance. God sees the heart. In fact, Jesus says when he comes and judge the living and the dead, many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all of these things with my hands for you? And he will say to them, depart from me. You work of iniquity. I, I never knew you. You thought it was about what you did. And for me, it was about what you were, what you are. God is not so impressed with your service as he is with the servant. You know, just the Lord reminded me of that just this week. I'm up in the mountains on Friday night and you know, I'm, I'm looking over my life like I so often do. I do self-examination. And I thought, Lord, so many areas I failed and I could have done better. I wished I would have done better. And, you know, I just, I'm pouring my heart out. I'm saying, Lord, I just, I wished I could, I wished I could know what I know now. And let, let me go back, you know, 35 years ago when I first, or 36 years ago when I first became a senior pastor, I could do better. And I could just hear my father say to me, it doesn't matter what you did. I saw your heart. And through it all, man, you sought me with all of your heart. And in that, I heard my father say, Mike, I'm well pleased. And by the way, there are no do-overs. <laughs> There's no mulligans in this thing, man. You learn as you go. But listen to what he says here. Isaiah 66, we're just going to look at verse 2. For all those things have my hand made, the things that you think you can make for me, listen, I could just speak and they could be there. And all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man or woman, to this person, will I look. Even to him or her, that is of a broken, a poor, a broken and contrite spirit. That has a teachable spirit. That's of a broken, humble and contrite spirit. And that trembles at my words. It takes God's word seriously. This is what God says is well-pleasing to him. Not the haughty man, the self-exalted man or woman who thinks they know everything and can't learn anything. Just they have that attitude about them. You can't tell me anything. But to the person that has that teachable spirit, that is broken before the Lord, that when God speaks, they listen. And they do their best to apply it to their lives. To that man, here, Isaiah says, God will look. You'll have his full and undivided attention. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. 
self-exalted, lifted up in pride and arrogance. And before honor is humility. Now, I want to make one more comment on this because this is the opposite of the world. Did you know that? The world is looking for the guy that makes things happen. He's a shaker and a mover, and they think that's the guy who promotes himself that will one day achieve honor. And yet the Bible says that's the opposite. That's not how you get there. The man is of a broken and contrite spirit who trembles at my words that, listen, has a teachable spirit. That man, when he humbles himself, one day I will lift him up. He won't lift himself up. I will lift him up. And maybe that day won't be to the other side of this thing. You know what? I'm, I, I am in absolute agreement with Pastor Chuck Smith. Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, we are going to be shocked when we get on the other side of this thing, the people that are lifted up and exalted by the Lord and the people who are not. The people who get the greater rewards and the people who get the less. Because the ones we thought should have got the most, didn't. And the ones we should have thought, well, we're, they should be lucky they're in heaven, are the ones God's going to say, now look at that one. Didn't Jesus point out the lady with the widow's mite? I have a widow's mite. It was circulated at the time that Jesus would have... It was circulated around Jerusalem at the time that Jesus would have walked. It might have been the same widow's mite. Um, I have one that's authenticated and, and has all the prominence to it. But wouldn't that have been amazing if that would have been the one? Because he said, after all you guys gave, because you gave out of your abundance, she gave out of her necessity. She gave more than you all. So we're going to be shocked, I think. But listen here. Just have a teachable spirit. Get alone with the Lord and don't make excuses. Don't justify. Just get on your face and say, Lord, speak to me. Your servant will listen. Circumcise my heart afresh and anew. Give me a meek and teachable spirit. Deal with me, Father. Verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it. How many people, you've ever been talking to some guy, and before you're even able to express what you're about to say, they're already trying to answer? Anybody ever had that? Because that person is not listening to learn, they're, they're listening to answer. But in this situation, it says, listen carefully, because this is an important one. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. The idea is to, to answer or to come to a conclusion before you hear both sides of the matter is the idea. And we're going to see that as we move on down. In fact, we'll move on down and we'll take a look at verse, um, uh, verse 17. Because verse 17 goes uh, with verse 13. Listen carefully. He that is first in his own cause seemeth right. Everybody come and tell you their side of some story. Ah, that seems right. But the neighbor, uh, his brother, he cometh and searcheth he searcheth him out. He hears the other side of the matter. And then when you hear the other side of the matter, the first one may not seem so right. A wise man, listen carefully, because we're, we're living in a world where people are slinging accusations and saying things, and sometimes they seem right. A wise person hears both sides of the matter before he comes to a conclusion. And if you don't, it is foolishness and folly. I'm going to tell you, for years, I would tell my wife that I'm a poor counselor. Um, I would have her set with me in counseling. Because I'm going to tell you, there's something about a woman who would come in with her husband, and she would start pleading her case, and because she was so emotional, and, you know, and, then, and I would just, whatever she said, that's right. You dirty rat, you know. And my wife said, no, no, you need to slow down a little bit here, because... You know, you're listening to her side, and you're not listening to his side because you want to defend her because she's the weaker vessel. And, and so for a long time, I would just sit there and be quiet and, and watch my wife because she's a lot more discerning than I am when it comes to listening to both sides of the matter and coming to a conclusion. You watch her, and I look corner of my eye, and then I say, well, what do you think, honey? And, and then she would say something. Then I would wax real eloquent as the pastor. Well, yeah, that's what I think, too. And uh yeah, you dirty rat. You shouldn't have treated your wife that way. You know, listen, you listen to both sides of the matter. A wise person does that. Don't listen to one side. Listen to both sides, you know. And then somewhere in the middle, I found somewhere in the middle is the truth. 36 years as a senior pastor doing, you know, marriage counseling and conflict counseling and family intervention and all these things. You know, I've rarely found one person 100% wrong and another person 100% right. Somewhere in the middle is the truth. 
In fact, I found out there's enough stupidity to go around when there's conflict. Can I use that word stupidity? I just did. Okay. There's enough of that stuff going around. Just Again, it goes back to the other verse. If you would just humble yourself and have a meek and teachable spirit, then there wouldn't be conflict anywise to hear both sides of it. Uh, let's, let's, do, let's do at least one or two more. Because number 14, again, it, it really has application to where we're at today. And I have a lot of my pastor friends, my heart just goes out, Dave Parada, Pastor Dave Parada, um, Jim and Susan's son. You know, they rented a school there in Discovery Bay, and now he can't meet in a school, and his congregation has no place to go. And, and as the enemy attacks, because you don't interact, things are starting to disintegrate. And there's a lot of things a man can bear. I want you to listen to this. This is important. This, this will hit home to you tonight. This may be the last verse that we can look at this evening. I have three other pastor friends. Um, some of them I've invited to sit on boards with me as we planted churches. One of them I invited to sit on the board with me as we planted a church in Quincy. And after one of the board meetings... Uh, Last year, he, he came to me afterwards, and he was just broken. Uh, he said, I, I want you to know, I want you to be the first to know that I'm resigning. Been in his church for 37 years. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just done. I don't want to do it anymore. And I could see that his spirit was broken. And there was nothing I could say. Another man had a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, spoken in this church, has stood in this pulpit. Called me up and said, I, I, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm quitting the church. I'm not going to be the pastor anymore, and I'm moving. I'm moving to Texas. I'm done. And there was no talking him out of it. Another good friend of mine, not far from here, we've all been to his church as men. He used to put on a men's conference. Called me up and said, I'm retiring. I'm done. Retire. Uh, Chuck never modeled that to us. Chuck was 86 years old, preached one of the best messages I've ever heard on Romans chapter 4 and 5, and then Wednesday went to be with the Lord. Listen carefully to this verse because I don't want you falling into this. The spirit of a man or a woman will sustain his infirmities. The idea is if he has the right attitude, if he is walking in the right spirit, if he's spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ and he is encouraging his spirit, there's nothing he can't go through. They that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They mount up with wings like eagles. They run and they don't grow weary and they walk and they do not faint. Would you say amen? If your spirit is in the right place with the Lord and you're in fellowship with Him, there's nothing in this life, it doesn't matter what it is, it can be cancer, it can be a devastation, it can be death in the family, it can be divorce, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be spiritual warfare. There is nothing that you cannot go through if your spirit is in the right place. There's nothing. Because here, God's Word says, that the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmities, will sustain him through his infirmities. But in contrast, a wounded spirit, who can bear it? When the spirit breaks and there's just an absolute giving up, when you let your tank run empty, when you run out of gas, because you haven't been spending that time allowing the Lord to build up your spirit, then you're done. Then you're done. And then there's nothing anybody can do at that moment because you're just done. 1,732 pastors left the ministry this month in the United States and will not return. And when you talk to them without exception, I'm out of gas. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm tired. I'm broken. I'm, I've been wounded too many times. I've been hurt too many times. I'm just done. 
and this verse. Not long ago, there was a man that we had in our church that was pastoring a church not far from here that thought the most novel thing he'd ever heard, and this man had been in the ministry as long as I had, that I would take a couple days a month and go to the mountains and spend a, a, a day and a night and, a, and the next morning just in prayer. In fact, he looked at me and said, if I would have done that, I would have stayed in the ministry. Well, why didn't you? You burn as fuel emotion. You burn as fuel feelings. You burn as fuel things. Listen, you leak. The, the, the baptism of the Spirit you got yesterday won't take you through tomorrow. You need a fresh feeling because we are leaky. Listen carefully to what Solomon is saying. He knows something of this. The Spirit of a man will sustain him through his infirmities. It will. It will sustain you. But if you allow your spirit to dry up, if you allow your walk with the Lord to wane, if you backslide in your faith when trouble comes, you will not be able to sustain yourself through it. That's why it's so important that you maintain that relationship with the Lord. Amen. That you find that place where you can spend time with the Lord, where you're asking Him, Lord, fill me afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Just rain on me, refresh my heart, circumcise my heart, Lord. Deal with the issues of my life. You know, just speak to me, Lord. I'm your servant. I'm here. I'm, I'm listening, Lord. I need for you to refresh me. Uh, some of you are on the same Facebook page, right? Do you see all the little worship songs I put on there by Dwayne Clark? I will tell you this, that guy blesses me. Our worship blesses me, but I've known Dwayne for a long time. And I know, I knew Dwayne when he had to communicate with a white grease board because of the polyps on his throat grew and he couldn't speak for a year. He, he couldn't speak for six months. He couldn't sing for a year. And he's a worship leader. That's how he makes his living. In fact, after the surgery, they didn't know if he was ever going to be able to even speak or sing again. We used to, as a church, and you guys didn't know this, we'd have him and his wife come up and stay at the Holbrook. There's, there's a place over the Holbrook that they'd like to stay. They never had him speak because he couldn't speak. The church just put him up just to bless him because he'd been such a blessing to us. But through it all, that man never lost the right spirit. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And now, man, he's back and, and just going through some of the old songs, the old Calvary songs and recording them so some of the new worship leaders would have a record of the old stuff that we used to sing back in the 70s. What a beautiful person. And I would just sit and listen to him yesterday because I just needed my spirit to be refreshed. I just it was in a place where I just needed to worship. Because I'll tell you, I, there's many times I just want to throw in the towel. And so I know... I know where to go. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And they that run into are safe. Listen, a man, if he's walking in the Spirit, that will sustain him through any trouble. But if his Spirit is not where it needs to be, who can endure it? Man, so important to maintain the heart and the relationship with the Lord. Would you say amen? Man, these are times, listen carefully, just a few verses we looked at tonight, let's tie a knot in this. Number one, we need to understand, we need to be about the master's business. Not to be slothful in these times, but to be about the master's business. We also need to understand that we've been given the authority of his name, and his name is a strong tower and just at the mentioning of the name of Jesus, there's so many benefits that come to us that we need to remind ourselves of. Ourselves of. And then this, listen, feed your spirit. Get alone with the Lord and refresh yourself. Man, come Mondays. I'm going to tell you what, when we got done Monday, we were looking for the devil because we wanted to kick his tail. I mean, that's how refreshed we were. Were we not? I mean, like, wow, where is he at? Not, we, you get to drag yourself in there on Monday and you leave there just all excited about the things of the Lord. How many had that experience Monday? Yes. And guess what? We're going to do it again on Monday. And I'm trying to figure out other days of the week we can do this. 
Because I'm just, one day is not working it for me, man. I'm, I'm at more days. Sunday morning, up in the prayer room, you can join us up there at 8.30 if you want to get here early before the service. Because here's the deal, guys. Listen, Jesus promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. The word tells us that if we wait on him, he renews our strength. Amen? We can run and never grow weary. We can walk and not faint. Because it is that spirit in a man, in a woman, that sustains them. And listen, if you don't think we're going through some troubled times, can I get an amen? amen. I'm going to tell you what's going to sustain you is the Lord Jesus Christ in you. The spirit of the living God in you. That will sustain you. If you don't have that, man, I don't know. It says here that a wounded spirit, who can bear it? And if you lose that, there's, I don't know how you're going to bear the rest of it. Amen.